All this. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming to this uh, CCF seminar, uh, where it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, Nora Knight, who uh, actually is an alumnus of USQ and also is an adjunct research fellow of Center for Crop Health. So uh, Nora did his PhD uh, here at USU. Uh, his supervisors were Mark Sutherland and Anke Martin and Damien. Uh, and then he did a postdoc at Cornell University in the US. And in 2020, he joined uh, the fungicide resistance group at the uh, Center for Crop Disease Management at Curtis University at Perth, uh, where he is currently working on uh, solving issues with fungicide resistance in Australian crops. So, uh, Nora, thank you for accepting our invitation to give us a talk, uh, and the floor is yours. Excellent. Well, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to present. So, the, the main focus of today, with a few variations, is looking at specific PCR, its design, its application, and using a couple of studies that we've, I've been working on the last year or so in rumble area called signal detection and identifying fungicide resistance in Pyrenopter terriers. So I'll just start by acknowledging the Gaiabal and Jarawa peoples as the traditional custodians of the land where we are today, as well as the Wajak people and the Noongar Nation as the traditional custodians of where Curtin University is located in Perth. And I just wanted to show off as well the, uh, in the left there, the aerial image of the Centre for Crop Health. You might recognise some of those buildings in the land. I thought that was a wonderful opportunity. It took about a year and a half ago flying over. So Levy just gave a pretty good background on uh, what my experience was with undergrad and PhD here at USQ, as well as a postdoc, and then at the US, and now at the Centre for Crop and Disease Management in Perth. So the Centre for Crop and Disease Management is a JRDC and Curtin University co-investment, where they have a range of different themes and projects examining a lot of different topics on crop disease issues. I'm particularly involved with the Fungicide Resistance Group, which is a national research project. So we collaborate with people across the country to look at fungicide resistance issues in a range of crops. A lot of it is based in cereals, but we do branch out outside of the theme as well into different uh, problems with grapes, as well as uh, we'll discuss a bit about some remuneria work. But we're looking at fungicide resistance protection, uh, characterising the mechanisms, looking at modelling, so what is the impact of fungicide resistance as well as the management of that resistance when it's present, and also looking at new technologies for diagnostics or looking into fungicide resistance. So I guess I come into looking at quantitative PCR from a particular perspective, having some experience looking at uh, fungal biomass and crown rot affected tissues for two different fusarium species, as well as detection of Sacospora beticola and Foam vitae on beet leaves and seeds, which was part of the US work. So there's certainly a lot of other applications that can use this type of method, but I will, as I said, give it from my perspective. And that has ended up with a range of different uh, detection issues being examined during design. So looking at specificity in particular, also discrimination between targets when they're very similar, and also sensitivity. I'll begin just by running through the two platforms that we're using for this sort of detection. So I'm focused on some sort of quantitative assay, not conventional PCR for the most part. And hopefully you're fairly familiar with a quantitative real-time PCR and their amplification curves. So basically, just by having the increase in the DNA product, we'll have an increase in fluorescence along uh, different CQ values. So quantification cycles. And here I've got a standard dilution series that you would then use to quantify the sample in red. So designing of these assays, it's really important, say if we're talking about species specificity, to find unique regions of DNA for your target that help to discriminate against non-target DNA of maybe closely related fungal species. So that usually then ends, I the way that I do it is put three prime and primers on polymorphisms, but I like to also include polymorphisms with a probe and finding regions that include all of that is not always straightforward. And I will run through some examples. So quantitative PCR does require a standard curve for quantification. In comparison 
a fairly recently emerging platform in terms of accessibility is digital PCR, particularly droplet digital PCR. But this technology was actually found before real-time PCR was described. It's just taken a while to come into the mainstream. But it works on the same premise, at least for the reaction chemistry, as quantitative PCR. You still have primers, uh, can have probes or intercalating dyes. And if you look at the tube uh, demonstration I have on the left, you'll just have your PCR mixture there with your DNA template. What happens for digital PCR is you split that, in this case it'd be 20 microliter reaction, into one nanoliter droplets using an oil emulsion technology. All this is sold by um, Biorad, there's maybe other companies, Biorad's out ahead, but they use oil emulsion to create these droplets. You might be able to make out on the screen, some of the droplets have DNA, some of them don't have DNA, they're just empty droplets. This is important for how the quantification method actually works. You then perform the PCR on these oil droplets and the PCR mixture inside. You'll see then some are actually fluorescing. They'll have your target DNA. Some will be non-target DNA. And some will again still be empty. So this is all based on endpoint fluorescence. Unlike real-time PCR where it's looking at the most early rise in your fluorescent signal, this is all at endpoint. And sometimes you're actually doing maybe 50 cycles to try and generate the most clear fluorescent signal at that endpoint position. You then read the droplets, so there's another machine that reads individual droplets, and you get a readout like this from the software. So we have a cluster here that has high fluorescence with the fluorescence amplitude on the y-axis. These would be droplets that have our target DNA, so each dot is a droplet. In comparison, you'll have these low fluorescing droplets. They will be negative, so either no target or a target or a DNA that's non-target DNA or an empty droplet. The software is then able to give you a copies per microliter value using Poisson distribution statistics. And this is all built into the software, luckily, but you can go and look into some of the details of this. But one of the selling points for digital PCR is you don't need to include a standard curve. You don't have the potential issues involved with creating that standard in the first place and using quantification methods, say a nano drop or a qubit uh, method. But it's still a really good idea to include at least one standard curve to understand your limits of detection and how the assay is actually behaving. And you can see on the x-axis, I've got hex sitting here, or VIC. It only reads on two channels for this machine. In this case, I've only got a uniplex, but you can have duplex and sometimes triplex or uh, tetraplex if you're getting a little expansive. And that's the same for real-time PCR. They just behave a little differently in interpretation. So then it leads into the first case study where we're looking at Ramularia leaf spot. So this is caused by Ramularia colocygni and affects barley crops. In Australia, Ramularia colocygni was reported in 2016 in Tasmania. However, the information around the detection is probably, it's not optimal for what we might be expecting if we want to do further examination. So it's a government report on a website, it's not a piece of scientific literature with the methods that were used for detection. And this is a slightly problematic fungus if you're not aware of how it grows. So it's predominantly a seed-borne pathogen. It grows asymptomatically within the crop until around head emergence or anthesis. At that point, with the right stress conditions in the plant, it will start to emerge as lesions on the leaves. And these are actually quite similar to what you'll see for net blotch fungi or for physiological leaf spotting. So having accurate diagnosis, particularly if you're unfamiliar with it, is quite challenging. And I can keep saying that because I'm yet to see a real living version of it. I've been sent samples as the best so far. Isolation is also a challenge. It's a very slow growing fungus. So it could be if you have other fungi present, it's just going to get outcompeted. And I'll just mention out of interest, it's called Colocygni as the Canidia floor has a swan neck style shape, which is, I haven't got to see that either apart from pictures, but I thought that would be one of the interesting things to hopefully down in one day under the microscope. What I'll point out about these particular lesions which I've shown here and these leaves are that, yes, there's Ramularia colocygni DNA present. There's also Pyronophoteres maculata, Pyronophoteres teres within these same leaf samples. So if they have similar symptoms, you can imagine that makes it even harder again to actually distinguish which is which, which means that PCR-based detection is essential for this pathogen. 
Now, I'm not the first person to think we should have a PCR assay to detect this. This is, there have been some assays described in around 2010. However, since that description, there's been a lot more work done on taxonomy, phylogenetic uh, assessment and sequencing of other Ramularia species. And even within the paper where one of these assays was described, they're not actually species specific. They generally amplified Ramularia. There were a couple of other examples of species in Ramularia genus that were being amplified. And we looked at this as well. We tried to think about it in terms of the life, local microbiome. So when you're developing any assay, you want to know what's actually in your environment. A lot of the work's been done in Europe, obviously quite different than what could be present. There may be undescribed species of Ramularia. I guess the one that jumped out at me as the most obvious was a Ramularia pusilla. And we did all the blast alignments of the different primes and probes of previously reported assays. 100% similarity. Now, why is that an issue or could be a potential issue? Ramularia pusilla has been associated with ryegrass, which is a fairly frequent weed within barley fields. So it's not too much of a leap to imagine that you could potentially have that fungus moving around and you may accidentally detect it and call it a Ramularia colicida. So what we can do about that is use some of the updated sequencing information. So Videra 2016 did quite a comprehensive sequencing of the Ramularia genus and came up with a number of different genes that weren't ITS, which previous assays have been based on, that allow for better species discrimination within the genus. So we chose RPV2 and TEF1 alpha for designing new assays. And there were some really nice polymorphic regions that were dissimilar to other Ramularia species, particularly those that we thought might be an issue in Australia. We ended up developing a triple X assay that's now been optimised for both the qPCR and DDPCR platforms. This is detecting two specific Ramularia colicidae markers, which we thought would be more robust, particularly as an emerging pathogen, that we have two markers that need to be both of those detected to actually say that that fungus is present, particularly when we're getting mixed samples and we're not able to isolate as easily as we would like. We also included with that the host barley DNA of an internal positive control. And that paid off for some of the samples that we were assessing. So we had some leaves that were sent to us that were quite old and senesced. When we extracted DNA, we started with assessing with the ITS assay and we got flat lines. We did it with the triplex assay, we still got flat lines. And of course, then we can say we're suspicious, there should be barley DNA we're extracting from leaves, even if they are very old. Luckily, it was an easy fix, a one in 10 dilution, all of a sudden we're getting very early quantification cycles. But there was some inhibitor, we don't exactly know what, but in SNES leaves, it's probably not a big surprise. But without the triplex assay and the host DNA to control, it's quite possible we call those a negative. Uh, those are just some of the uh, culture, what they look like. You get a fairly pink, but they get a very red coloration underneath that release of pigment. So that means we're trying to detect with quantitative PCR, which as a multiplex option is fairly straightforward. You just have three different fluorophores on your probes. They come up with those S-shaped amplification curves, relatively straightforward. The droplet digital PCR and multiplexing, it's a little bit, I guess, different in the interpretation. So duplex is straightforward. You would end up with potentially four clusters or, uh, and I'll go through what these might mean. So we have a negative cluster, fairly straightforward droplets that don't have target DNA or they have no DNA at all. We have our barley DNA amplicon. We have our Ramularia RPV2 amplicon. And we can have a mixture of both of those together within one droplet. For amplitude-based PCR, the digital, you then can start to pull apart fluorescence for the two different amplicons by increasing the primer and probe concentration for one of those. So in this case, the, uh, the Ramularia TEF1 alpha has a high concentration of primers and probe. And you can see it pulls the amplitude quite distinctly away from where the RPV2 concentration is uh, developing. And then you also have the combination of RCC TEF1 alpha with the barley. You could have droplets that have both the Ramularia markers within them, or you could have all three markers in one droplet. And based on that, the software, you, you tell it what's in and sitting where, it's able to give us a copy number. So in this, this example, one of the leaves from Tasmania, we have about 350 copies of each of those different targets. So it's, I think it's relatively straightforward once you pull those apart, but it's a, a different way of looking at it than real-time PCR. 
We also did a comparison then between the two platforms. This is the linear relationship for a dilution series for the RPV2 at the top and TEP1 alpha at the bottom. You can see essentially both platforms have performed quite similarly. They have a limit of detection of one picogram. This is fairly uh, common for real time PCR. That's about a cycle, quantification cycle of 35 or about one copy per microliter. In terms of the re total reaction volume, that's about 20 copies of your gene target within the entire 20 microliters. So what's, I guess, how do we look at sensitivity and where we start to have limit of detection? Well, I look, there's some more high powered statistical methods where you can do uh, hundreds of runs to see how often you might like detect something. I went on a simpler version where you basically do your dilution series at a point where I can't, in triplicate, always detect each of the dilutions. I'll say, well, that's going to be below my confidence in detection. On the other side, I've also included a range of different other fungi that might be present within cereal crops. We included those at fairly high concentrations of DNA, basically the highest concentration in our standard curve, and then examine, do they give any tiny amount of fluorescence, maybe by less optimal binding in digital, if you're doing 50 cycles, the TAC enzyme can start to amplify where it's not meant to. Based on that and a range of different fungi, we came up with occasionally you'd have amplification looking about 0.5 copies per microliter. We thought if we have one copy that's fitting with our standard curve, it means that we're not seeing great concentrations or high concentrations of other fungi. We've got pretty good confidence we're not going to have a false positive. So basically then between the two platforms, digital PCR has the benefit of not meeting a standard curve. It may have an advantage over very low copy numbers as you're looking at a level of fluorescence within the droplets rather than just a late increase in fluorescence. It also takes probably three times as long as running one plate of qPCR it's probably, I would estimate, 10 times as expensive. It's a lot more expensive as well as the machine itself. Uh, so you really need to know what, do you need that technology for what you're looking at? What is grey at? Copy number variance. It's basically the standard now that you would go to to look at copy number changes within genes. Uh, if you're looking at very low copy numbers, it may also have a benefit. And with our assay, in terms of the limit as well, because we have two different markers for malaria, we said both of those markers have to be present and detected. If we only detect one, it's a, it's a negative as far as we can call it. So that starts to enforce why we use triplex, particularly in this new pathogen that is a little bit tricky to diagnose. So how have we applied this so far? So it's a relatively small set of samples that we've been given by collaborators. But you can see in the red dots in South Australia, Tasmania and Victoria, we've had 100% detection looking at 10 leaves from each of, basically single fields from each of these states, 100% detection at what appears to be quite high concentrations of the fungus. In Western Australia, out of more than 100 leaves, we had one detection that was positive. It's quite uh, reasonable to say that you may actually have an emerging population or it may be emerging at least in the location where our samples came from. So I think that really starts to open up a lot more of the questions around this pathogen now. So what's its origin? We're not predominantly seed borne likelihood that it's coming on some sort of seed into Australia. What's that pathway and are we starting to manage that pathway now so we're not constantly reintroducing this pathogen? What's the, I get a, a great, greater understanding of regional distribution. And within the regions where it's present, what's the incidence and severity, which leads us into the important question of what's the impact of this disease. Within Europe, it's reported about five to 25% losses, up to 70% if it's, if it's severe. And within Australia, the environment, we don't really know how it works as yet because it's generally thought of as a, a cooler and wetter environment where the disease is worse. In Australia, of course, there's not necessarily as much of those environments. So how it's going to interact is, uh, currently unknown. And that leads us then to control. We know it's here, we'll have to look at controls. Variety resistance, very little information. Basically all the major studies have been done in Europe, so we don't know how Australian cultivars will react. 
There's maybe a, a little bit of information coming out now for resistance to be available, so it may be something within our germplasm. Managing debris, say, as an inoculum source, it's a little bit up for debate what the major inoculum, inoculum source is, apart from the seed itself, which is a very uh, well-accepted way for this fungus to move around. And then fungicides. So fungicides are already sprayed to control this around places where it's been for a while in Europe. We also know that the resistance is also occurring within this pathogen. So it has resistance to QOI fungicides, there's at least reduced sensitivity to the DMI and SDHI fungicides. This starts to lead us a little bit into the next topic within the presentation on Pyrenophora teres and the fungicide resistance development. Now, as I said before, the leaves where we found some of this Rumbularia, Pyrenophora fungi were also there. We're currently spraying for the Pyrenophora fungi with the very similar fungicides that you would use for Rumbularia control. However, in Australia, there's no registered product for Rumbularia. So that might mean that we're already putting selection pressure on these Rumbularia populations, as we're doing for the Pyrenophora populations. But we just don't know enough, have enough information yet to know what's actually out there. What we do know is for the Pyrenophora fungi, resistance has developed and it's fairly widespread. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that that is also happening in Ramularia at the same time, which I think is a risk that we need to be aware of. But that brings us now to fungicide resistance detection. And this will be in terms of Pyrenophora teres, teres and maculata for the spot form net form pathogens on barley. So fungicides are a critical control option for keeping these diseases at bay. However, resistance has been reported. It seems to be conferred by single base changes quite frequently in target genes, or also an example of an indel in a promoter. There has been reduced sensitivity or resistance reported for the DMI fungicides, demethylation inhibitors, and the succinate dehydrogenase inhibitors. So as an example, reduced sensitivity is generally, you might see a bit more disease in the field, you might not notice that as having an impact on the crop necessarily. That will depend a little on frequency. Resistance, you could reasonably expect to see field failure of that product for controlling the disease. So resistance in a pathogen is going to have quite severe effects, but reduced sensitivity uh, is also something that we need to get a better grasp on. So of course that then has significant implications on how you manage disease, as it may mean that you actually have to change chemicals, if you're a grower, what chemicals you're actually using, you might not have access to all of the chemicals you would like. So we do a reasonable amount of extension and we're talking about fungicide resistance management and this is basically in terms of disease management principles. So we have variety selection, basically if you can choose the most resistant or least susceptible types, that will reduce the pressure on your fungicide applications later in the season hopefully to let them be less applications or not as often. And then integrated disease management. Managing any of the inoculum sources to try to reduce disease pressure, so stubble management would be uh, one of the obvious things as well as crop rotation. And on top of that, sort of the last line of defense, uh, the application of fungicides. And really trying to get the message out there that apply strategically, not just as a scripted manner that you always spray this, then this, then this, as that's going to be a recipe for disaster at some point. And then trying to rotate with, between and within modes of action. So if you can start with an SDHI as a seed treatment, maybe a DMI is next. If you have mixtures available, that's even better, as it tends to then take into account of, of resistances come across for one, it may control with the other. And also staying within label rates, as it's quite tempting to either use a bit less or maybe a bit more if you think you've got more disease, but that's not necessarily going to give you a benefit. So in 2020, we were sent some samples and we get sent lots of different samples. And we had a quick look at some leaves and found that there was SDHI resistance in some spot form net blotch pathogens. So this is the first report of SDHI resistance in the spot form net blotch. It's just been reported about a year before in the net form net blotch in South Australia. So this is the first time in Australia itself has been reported in Europe, in particular, in this case, in Cunsden in Western Australia. And the region where this was happening had a very particular paddock history. 
and its management style. So it was barley on barley for at least the last three years. It was Sestiva on Sestiva, which is an SDHIC treatment on those same three years as well, on one variety of barley being Spartacus. So out of what I was just suggesting in terms of management, this goes against a lot of what optimal management would be. And it's not that the grower isn't necessarily aware of what they need to do, it's that in terms to actually have a crop that makes money, barley is their crop, particularly in these regions where they have salinity issues. In terms of crop rotation, there's really limited options, as well as trying to get it to a market that will buy that particular crop in that region. So where's Cunderton? It's about two hours northeast of Perth. This is one of the fields where we went and took samples, which looks quite reasonable. <coughs> Others can look a bit patchier, which is around these salinity issues that they have in the region. So it's a low to medium rainfall zone. You won't have big expansive crops, but certainly a, uh, a quite a reasonable crop. And the soil compared to what you'll be seeing here in the Darling Downs is quite a contrast. So very sandy compared to the, the deep black vertisols that we experience here. And there was plenty of inoculum. So we saw pseudothesia on the stubble. There was, so sexual recombination was occurring within the fields, as well as asexual canidia being present. So a lot of that able to move around. And it was a struggle, I think, to try to think how, what could be done to manage inoculum. There's low medium rainfall zone, there's not a lot of stubble. So say burning is not an option that's easy for these locations. Plowing and tilling it in is not necessarily what we recommend because it disrupts other parts of the soil structure. <coughs> so crop rotation would be good if it was an option. But as we collected all of this, say, initial information and then went and looked at more samples, we took this particular perspective for our workflow is when we get a field sample, we'll start with phenotyping and then move into genotyping. So phenotyping allows you to have living fungi, which means it can encompass all of the different potential genotypes. And you can define resistance by different categories, which are based on the concentration of the fungicide. And that would give us our reduced sensitive or resistance or sensitivity. We can then detect the different frequencies of them presence and absence within these categories. That information can relatively rapidly then be distributed back out to agronomists and growers so they can know how to start managing if they have a particular issue. We then move into genotyping. Initially, of course, you have to sequence the genes of interest, locate where changes have occurred in order to then define what gene types are actually present and then ideally link those to a phenotype. This allows us, after production of a quantitative or specific PCR assay, to detect and quantify the ratios of these different genotypes that are present. All leading us to what we want is to get numbers around reduced sensitivity and resistance that can be reported back to enable some sort of management strategy to occur. We're also optimistic that we can move straight from a field sample to a genotype once we're comfortable with knowing what genotypes are present. There is a complication to that, which you'll see in a couple of slides. But to start with our phenotyping method, so this was put together initially by a master student, Kul Adhikari, and we've since streamlined that to get it to be relatively high throughput. So we get leaves from the field, surface sterilise them, chop individual lesions out, put them onto our wells with media. Once they grow and if they morphologically look similar to one of the pyronophora fungi, we harvest and collect that mycelia and fragment it. We can then place it onto our different doses of fungicide. I have an example here of tebiconazole, which is a DMI fungicide at 50 micrograms per mil. If there's any fungi growing in this concentration, it's classed as resistant. We can use then different fungicides, different concentrations, and report the growth as either sensitive, reduced sensitive or resistant, the frequency of those. And that's the information that can potentially move straight out to inform growers and agronomists. We can also move to the next stage where we can collect the hyphae, single spore of the isolates and extract DNA to initially do DNA sequencing of genes, but then ideally move into qPCR or digital PCR to have more high throughput detection of particular uh, alleles of interest. So an example where this has been uh, used quite well has been at Cunderdon. We went and sampled five different fields. And here I present some pie charts on the frequency of the reduced sensitive or resistant types as well as sensitive. You'll see in a couple of these fields that they're actually greater than 50% reduced sensitive, which seems very high and is probably having an effect 
uh, on the crop, uh, absolutely, as well as a number of resistant types, even though at a less frequency. What you'll notice, there's one field that didn't have any reduced sensitive or resistant types. This was a different cultivar in bass. There's also a grower that manages inoculum with burning, so that was an option for this grower. Now, burning is not always a great option or an accepted option, but it does give an example of when inoculum can be managed more, I guess, more efficiently, it can have a big benefit in reducing some of that disease load that's left over. Now, but there could be other information around that to uh, pull out as well. It's a little bit distant from some of the other regions, so understanding how inoculum is moving is also important for interpreting these results. And I think that's still something that's under investigation. Other things of interest within this population were that 3% exhibited reduced sensitivity to both the SDHI and DMI fungicides. So if we're saying that, okay, that's the SDHI resistant or reduced sensitive, use another chemical, DMI, there's already individuals within this population that are resistant. So it will start selecting for those. You may end up compromising two chemistries quite rapidly. And what's interesting on top of it is that the SDHI used in Cestiva was only released in 2015. This is now 2020 and we have some paddocks that have greater than 50% reduced sensitive populations. So it's, the fungus is rapidly developing resistance and it's not just one genotype. So about three weeks ago, we inadvertently found another reduced sensitive genotype within the population. So it may be the numbers here on the sensitive frequencies could be less than what we're currently reporting. And this is now being investigated a little further and going and checking a lot of our collection. So it's currently, I think it's three to four reduced sensitive genotypes, one resistant genotype within, in some cases, one of these fields. So it's in, impressive biologically of the diversity of resistance or reduced sensitivity that's present. And it may mean management is not quite so straightforward. So we think the genotyping is going to be really important and we want to try to detect and quantify genotypes that are associated with these sensitivity, reduced sensitivity and resistance types. And this is the workflow that we put together to enable us to do that and gather a bit more information than just the phenotype. So we start with the pure fungus. Ideally, we could also use field samples and this is still being investigated. We extract that DNA and then the first part of our detection is can we find DNA of either Pineapple teres teres or Pineapple teres maculata. As long as we can detect either of those, we can then move into our next set of detection assays. And so I've presented here some of the different genes of interest. So we have our CYP51 which, and its promoter, which are the targets for demethylation inhibitors. We have the succinate dehydrogenase subunits C and D genes, which are related to the SDHI fungicides and their target. Next to the genes themselves, I've presented different genotypes which have currently been described and you'll see there's quite a range. In some of these, say for CYP51, there's three different SNPs that have changed in order to generate a resistance level compared to the sensitive type. We also, while SNPs are the predominant type here, there's in the CYP51 promoter, there's an indel. So it looks like an insert within this particular promoter that's enabling resistance to occur. And we've then developed assays around five different insertion points that have been described so far. So as you can see, this, in terms of going from phenotype to genotype, it rapidly expands into a lot of different assays that need to be run in order to pick out which one's present. But we do have assays now for each of these different genotypes. So that's been a big chunk of my last year of developing those and finding out ways to actually discriminate appropriately. So I will go into a little bit of technical detail of how these are developed. And I think we'll start with the, what I think is the easier one, which is the indel in the CYP51 promoter. So you can do size discrimination using the interpolating dye like cyber green, detect the presence or the absence of the indel based on the milk curve. Which is good because then it means it doesn't matter if it's changed the insertion point by just a little, and it's always the same size of the insert, we can detect it's present or absent. But if it's the case that where it's actually inserting itself has an effect on how effective that change in the promoter is, we also have specific assays for that insert position. And in order to do that, place the primer across the five prime junction, place a probe across the three prime junction and have a conserved reverse primer. 
I think that's more straightforward so far, and those assays worked fairly easily for specific detection, even in combination of all the different options that we know about. Then we come to our single nucleotide polymorphisms in the CYP51 and SDH CMD subunit genes. So the question was how to discriminate between SNPs as well as enabling quantification at the same time discriminating against the range of different SNPs which could be present in the mixture. Now there are several different approaches that can be used and I went with the one that made the most sense to me in how I understand PCR and its binding abilities to work, which is a modification, modification of what Billard uh, reported in 2012. And I will talk about an example of how this can be applied. And I'll use CIP51 as the example. So remember there's four different alleles, some of them are sensitive, some of them are more resistant. And we have two different SNP positions which made it a bit more of a headache. It was all in one position as for the top three, relatively straightforward. We get the same change in the protein for its F489L, except one of the SNPs is at the first base instead of the last base in the codon. So to just simplify viewing, I'll just blank out the conserved regions and we'll just focus on these SNP positions. So what we have are a conserved reverse primer. We can then place the forward primer, so the three prime end is sitting on the SNP, harnessing as much discriminatory power as we can from that primer. The probe is also placed across the SNP. It's about four bases upstream within the probe. However, they're placed so that they bind to the two different strands. So the primer will be on the forward, the probe on the reverse strand. And that's trying to then leverage the discriminatory ability of both the primer and the probe to enable this discrimination between SNPs. Included into that is the addition of a lock nucleic acid as a modified base. So lock nucleic acids are meant to have greater binding affinity for the complementary base compared to a native base. Sometimes this is the case, sometimes it's not necessarily as improved binding. It is base dependent. But they've been included on those SNP positions in the primer of the probe. Unfortunately, even with this amount of detail, it's still not necessarily discriminating to a level that is acceptable, particularly in mixtures. So you might have to think about pure PCR, it might give you a five cycle difference in terms of where it's sitting. Ideally, you'll have only one being detected and no off-target amplification at, at all. So to try and get this, Billard included a deliberate mismatch into their forward primer. So in this case, it's about five bases upstream from your SNP position, so it's trying to not interrupt the TAC binding itself and amplification, but if you, for target DNA, you'll only have one SNP, it'll be a deliberate mismatch upstream, not having the greatest effect in amplification. For non-target, you then have two mismatches. It's going to disrupt your PCR efficiency much more than just a single disruption. So that's what Billard had, and they seem to be quite good at discriminating. I've gone a step further and then included another deliberate mismatch into the probe to try to disrupt its binding ability as well. So essentially, if you can find the optimal and highest temperature for your PCR, it gives you a lot better discrimination. And my rule has been either you get no detection of the off-target DNA, which is optimal, or at least about uh, nine to 10 cycle separation, which is about a thousand fold difference in DNA quantity. So it starts to sound a little complicated, and I'll admit it is. It's not a perfect science. There are a lot of considerations when you're trying to put these together. And the first would be how many bases to overlap. So I've shown there's about four bases overlap for the primer and probe. You can vary that. Four is about the maximum, maybe four to five, but you could do less. Mismatch dynamics is probably the most important part, as not all mismatches are created equal. If you're trying to disrupt PCR, Having an AA or a GG mismatch is going to have a much greater effect than a CA or a TG. And Stadhouders is a resource that I've been using to try and inform my decisions around this, where they show how mismatches can affect CQ values. What I've seen sometimes is say for your CA or a TG is you basically don't have a mismatch for PCR. It's amplifying at the same efficiency as if it wasn't even there. So you might have seen when I added my own mismatches, I tried where I could to choose a CC or a GG 
and put it in a similar position for each of the assays. But this isn't always straightforward either, as adjacent sequences will affect the impact that your mismatch might have. You have a lot of Gs and Cs, obviously they're clamping together, the mismatch is not going to have much of an effect. So where you position the mismatch can also uh, vary depending on what the actual sequences are. The major con for this approach is that if you're disrupting PCR efficiency, you're inevitably disrupting your sensitivity for quantification. And it may be that some of the lower levels you can't detect with as much confidence. And also the dis discrimination issue, I was saying sometimes at best you might only be able to get nine cycles in difference between target and non-target allele. In order to account for this though, you can have a set of rules. So generally if you're detecting your non-target DNA, it's because there's a lot of it. It's got to have a lot to still detect it at that thousand fold difference. So if you set up rules around how much DNA that you can add to a reaction, you can start to account for some of these issues and have more confidence in interpreting when you have a positive versus when it should be non-target DNA. So the outcomes and applications. Phenotyping method is now pretty well used and it's been streamlined quite a lot. It's been used in the York Peninsula to report the fungicide resistance in Netform Netwatch and in Cundedon now for Spotform Netwatch. And that's been complementing really well into the genotyping method, which we want to use to screen collections. So we're currently in the phase of growing up a lot of uh, different isolates to then look at frequencies of these different reduced sensitive and resistant types. And ideally, it's going into detection then and quantification directly from leaf samples. We could look at ratios in the field. You could potentially bulk samples, not individual leaves, to get an idea of what the mixture is within a field. And we're looking at expanding into that as the next step. And the assay should also allow us to understand better the detection in stubble, seed and air and how the fungus is surviving and spreading. In particular, reduced sensitive and resistant types. How are they moving around in the landscape? So Cundinan is a great example. of There was one field that had no reduced sensitive or resistant types. If we think the fungus is able to move over a long distance, why is it not in that field? Can we understand that better by actually finding inoculum sources for these reduced sensitive and resistant types? I think that will be a fairly fruitful set of investigations. Also just take a moment to spruik the Australian Fungicide Resistance Extension Network. So it's a group of experts around the country that put together information around local issues and resistance and other issues and get that out to growers and researchers as well, a lot of different ways. But recently a fungicide resistant management guide has been released. If you're interested in some of the issues around this in Australia at the moment, I do recommend you have a look. It's really well laid, laid out very well, uh, quite succinct, and most of the information you're really interested in is there. And now finally, just the take home messages from this presentation. So we can say that Ramularia colosigny is present across the southern barley growing regions of Australia. And we now have an assay that will allow us to have much more confidence in our detection. We have the first report of SCHI resistance in spot form netwatch in Australia. In the fields where we sampled, there was a high frequency of reduced sensitive types, which seems to lead back to the management practices that were used in those fields. Now this is occurring in low to medium rainfall zones, at least for the, we've only looked at a small region. I don't think it's a stretch to say that it is quite likely that it's further and more widespread. And now that we know to start looking for it, it may be popping up in other locations. And that's really important for us to be aware of and to try to get onto that as early as possible. And the detection methods that we've talked about today and some of the applications and designs for both ramularia and fungicide resistance will now allow greater monitoring for the distribution, understanding how the fungus is moving and then leading to this workflow that I come back to going from field samples to either phenotyping or genotyping as a way to get us to evidence-based and informed management for growers. And that's our major output is where can this information be used to actually manage these issues and to make people aware that when they're present. So after that, I'd just like to acknowledge our fungicide resistance group at the Centre for Crop and Disease Management. So there's a lot of work that goes in as a team here for sampling you know, thousands potentially of leaf lesions. Uh, I do appreciate a lot of that work. And also our collaborators at FAR Australia, at DPIRT and WA, 
University of Perugia in Italy and DKT Rural Agencies in Cunderdon. And of course, GRDC for funding a lot of this uh, research. And thank you, I'm happy to have any questions.